So you've picked up from the, the first two talks that the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium has a heavy emphasis on medical oncology and chemotherapy and hormone therapy. There are other disciplines that get talked about as well, such as surgery and imaging and genetics, et cetera, et cetera. Every now and then, there's a little chink in the armor and some radiation therapy squeaks in. And so I, I stand before you tonight as a fraud because I wasn't at San Antonio. I didn't get to see the lights that John showed you. But I, I did get the information on one of the, the important radiation oncology papers that came up at this last session. So we'll talk a little bit about that this evening. I also did not sleep at a uh, Holiday Inn Express last night. So in general, we're looking at some evolution in terms of how breast cancer treatment is taking place. So mastectomy was initially pioneered by William Halstead in the late 1800s. And at that time, breast cancer was a different animal. It was typically not found early. There was not self-examination. You did not have imaging. The mammography did not exist. And so the breast cancer that surgery was tailored for in that era was typically for large, locally advanced tumors, frequently with lymph node involvement, not the kind of cancer we see nearly as often in this day and time. And so what evolved in the 1900s was a recognition that not everybody had to have a mastectomy. And this was initially in Europe that was demonstrated that patients with breast cancer particularly early tumors, could be effectively and successfully treated with lumpectomy, taking only the lump out, leaving the breast, and then following with radiation therapy. There have been a number of randomized clinical trials run in Europe and in North America, clearly demonstrating equivalent long-term outcomes in terms of survival in patients with either mastectomy versus lumpectomy and, and radiation therapy. The latter can be referred to as breast conservation therapy. And so in this era, there's emphasis being placed on how much radiation do we really need to use for patients who've had a lumpectomy? Can we get by with less radiation? And there certainly are some trends in that particular direction. So at this point in time, there is emphasis on seeing if, in fact, we can find good clinical evidence for throttling back on the amount of radiation therapy that would be necessary to get a good result for patients being treated with breast conservation, with lumpectomy. So the general concept is that after a lumpectomy, after the surgeon takes the lump out of the breast but leaves the breast, there's a need to follow with radiation therapy. So this is just a diagram of how we approach treating initially the entire breast, treating with opposed beams of radiation covering the inner and the outer aspect of the breast on a daily basis, treating typically five days a week, Monday through Friday, for a certain number of weeks. And then the last lap on breast conservation radiation is to follow with what we call a lumpectomy site boost, where the idea will be to focus on the area where the lump came out of the breast, use a small treatment area of radiation to cover that area where the lump used to be, where the highest likelihood of any residual cancer cells would reside, and then to do typically another week of radiation therapy in that setting. If you look at different recipes of radiation therapy that have evolved, the standard approach that has track record going back 30 plus years and more if you go back to the European data would call for a five week course of radiation therapy to the whole breast or sometimes five and a half weeks depending on how you split it up. And very often you would follow after that the boost treatment we talked about that would tack on an extra week of therapy at the tail end. So the overall treatment time for a patient with conventional standard breast conservation therapy, you're talking in terms of six, six and a half weeks of radiation therapy, depending on how fast you go, how you slice it. However, in Canada, there has been data presented from a 10-year randomized trial showing that they can do it faster up there across the border. And in fact, looking at patients getting 16 treatments for the whole breast or 16 treatments plus a boost, which would take you up to four weeks of total treatment in the post-lumpectomy setting. The 10-year data from that particular trial has demonstrated that the efficacy, the success of that particular treatment in avoiding recurrence within the breast is equivalent with the standard treatment. It's also shown that toxicity is equivalent as well. What we don't have for the Canadian data is longer term data. With the standard data, we've got 20, 25 year data. 
to know how well those patients do, not just in five years or 10 years, but over the long haul. With the Canadian data, we've got good data for 10 years. We're looking to see later data, but at this point in time, the 10-year data is looking very favorable. There's an alternative approach also called accelerated partial breast irradiation for patients who've had lumpectomies, where there are three different methods to treat not the entire breast, but treat only the lumpectomy site with different types of radiation, either external beam radiation or brachytherapy, internal radiation therapy. That's a much more involved topic than we're going to be able to have time to get into tonight, but the, the key message is for selected patients, for the right patients, this type of treatment can be done within a week where you're doing treatment twice a day, five days in a row, then you're done. It's not for every patient, but for selected patients, it can be a very effective and very practical way to approach the problem. And then, do we need to use radiation therapy at all? How about no radiation therapy? There have been concerted efforts looking into, can we forego radiation? And what the data tells us, what the studies will inform us, is that there are no patients who've had lumpectomy that do not benefit from radiation therapy, but the magnitude of the benefit will vary a bit depending upon the specific features of a particular patient's tumor. How big is it? How adequate are the surgical margins? Is it an estrogen receptor positive tumor? Is it an estrogen receptor negative tumor? Are there lymph nodes involved? Those factors have a lot of bearing, and for a small subset of patients, elderly patients, typically above 70, I'm always in trepidation when I judge what's age or what's elderly in this day and time. But for elderly patients with small tumors under a centimeter in diameter, with negative surgical margins, with an estrogen receptor positive tumor, and particularly patients who may have other medical issues that may limit their life expectancy, it can be a very reasonable clinical decision for that patient to make an informed cho choice to forego radiation therapy and take estrogen or anti-estrogen, excuse me, the tamoxifen to reduce that risk of recurrence. Those patients would benefit from radiation, but to a slight degree, and the benefit may be so modest to be foregone by an informed patient. But that's a very select set of patients. It's not everybody. So the trial that was reported at San Antonio that we'll talk briefly about tonight was what's called the UK START trial, which stands for Standardization of Breast Radiotherapy. This is the 10-year result, so it's comparable to the Canadian trial that we talked about. And the idea was to look at women who had completely excised invasive breast cancer, treated at 35 centers in the British Isles between 1999 and 2002. So it's been a few years back to give us 10-year follow-up data. And 90% of those patients were breast conservation, post-lumpectomy. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. Median follow-up for these patients, there are two different chunks of this trial, basically were almost 10 years. And that's a long follow-up. That's actually pretty good data. And if we look at the trials, there are two portions here. There's a start A, start B. Start A looked at over 2,000 patients, which is a pretty hefty number of patients, divided them up into three different arms. One group received five weeks of radiation therapy, treating whole breast at doses 50 gray. That's a dose of radiation that we use for the breast. In two gray per day, 25 fractions, five treatments, uh, excuse me, one treatment a day, five days a week for five weeks. That's a pretty standard recipe. They forego a boost in this particular situation for many of these patients, but not in every single patient. Excuse me, every single patient. The alternate was to look at a more abbreviated course of therapy from the standpoint of how many days were being treated, but the duration was the same. It was still a five-week course of therapy, looking at a lower radiation dose of 39 gray with more radiation dose per treatment. It was 13 treatments over the five weeks. So patients were not being treated every day of the week. They typically are being treated three days a week. The third piece of the START-A trial was, again, going back to the five-week regimen, but going with a slightly higher dose of radiation per daily treatment of 3.2 gray for 13 treatments. So it's a little higher dose than the intermediate group there. The alternate is a START-B trial. Go back here. START-B trial compared the standard treatment, the 50 gray in five weeks, against a more abbreviated course of therapy and squeezed it down to three weeks of therapy, 
treating five days a week, Monday through Friday, for three weeks to deliver a dose of 40 gray total, 2.67 gray per day. So the idea was to compress it down a bit, make it faster, get it done quicker for the patient. And what we found from these results, if we look at the START-A trial, the important information is those curves on the left-hand graph are remarkably close to each other. But if you begin to expand them apart and look at the right-hand graph, you'll see that the, the cumulative risk of recurrence over time, over the 10 years, begins to spread apart at the different dose levels that you're looking at. And these are still small numbers. The, the peak there is only about 9% maximum recurrence at 10 years. But we're looking at the doses where the, the 50 gray and the 41.6 gray had very similar results. The 39 gray was not quite as good. And so if you look at the 10-year recurrence rate within the, the highlighted circle there, recurrence rates for the 39 gray arm were a little bit higher than the other two arms and were statistically significant to the point that it was pretty well identified that the 39 gray arm was not something to pursue further. If we look at the trial B, however, that was taking the standard treatment of five weeks and shrinking it down to three weeks, actually the three-week regimen came up with a slightly better result in the long run, a slightly lower risk of recurrence within the breast, down to the rate of about 4.3% risk of recurrence in the breast at 10 years. That's a remarkably no, low number. You don't cure everybody with breast cancer or everybody receiving breast conservation therapy, but this is a remarkably good result in the sense that 96% of patients receiving this type of regimen will not see a recurrence in the breast at 10 years. If you look at the, going back here, if you look at the cosmetic results, if I can master the control here, over these 10 years of follow-up, the physician scored what type of cosmetic result was seen with these particular patients. And what is true over time is that patients who've had lumpectomy and radiation therapy will see a degree of sometimes breast shrinkage to an extent, sometimes some firmness in the breast, sometimes some tanning or darkening of the breast to a modest extent, although most patients end up with a very good cosmetic result in the long run. When you looked at the three pieces in the trial A, the results are they're actually tracked very closely together. There wasn't a great deal of difference. If anything, the 39 gray that we talked about already as being inferior came out a little bit different than the other two, but still pretty darn close. If you look at the trial B, the again, the results here, we're looking at number or percent of patients with no significant effects, in other words, with good results, then the 40 gray, the short trial over three weeks, actually had slightly higher out, our, our outcomes or slightly better cosmetic outcomes going out to 10 years, such that if you compared the two together, you find that the patients who had the shorter regimen, the 40 gray in three weeks, had about a 77% likelihood compared to the longer group of having a, a, an inferior cosmetic result. So the cosmetic results were better in the shorter regimen. So to go back and give you perspective, we talked about the standard regimen that can run five to six, six and a half weeks, depending whether or not you use a boost. Most often a boost is employed. Canadian regimen can be done in four weeks even with a boost. And then we talked about APBI for a week and then no treatment for a select number of patients. If we look at the START trials, we're talking in terms of START A running five weeks for all three of those arms versus a shorter regimen of three weeks, which was a START B. And even if you add a boost, you're done inside of four weeks here. So time-wise, it's comparable to the Canadian regimen on the START B trial. And not every patient gets a boost with the START B or with the Canadian or START B, but in this country, most patients do receive a boost. In Canada, it's a little bit different universe over there. But the data that comes out of the trials is actually, I think, very compelling in the sense that a shorter course of radiation therapy is a reasonable option for many patients. We prefer not to use the short course of therapy in the post-mastectomy setting or patients who've had positive lymph nodes who need regional lymph node treatment. Short course therapy is not ideal for patients with very large breasts. The cosmetic challenges there dictate a more standard regimen. But this particular 
approach with the START B trial is now the standard in the United Kingdom where they have the ability with the National Health Service to pretty well mandate what's going to be used nationally throughout the entire country. We don't have that luxury in this country. And so the conclusions to take home from tonight would be that breast cancer patients can very often be safely and effectively treated with shorter radiation therapy regimens. The trials that have been done do not show us detrimental effects to these shorter regimens with 10-year follow-up, both in Canada and the United Kingdom. More data is needed to get the longer-term results, but at this point, 10-year data looks very good. And at this point, in the United Kingdom, for early breast cancer patients, the shorter trial of three weeks has now become the standard. So going forward, we are using short course therapy in selected patients. We often will talk to patients about that as an alternative to more conventional therapy. And we do not have just one approach of how we treat every breast conservation patient, but we individualize and we'll talk with patients about what's reasonable for their particular clinical scenario going forward. So enough of radiation therapy tonight. We're going to turn over the table now to the interesting part of the talk to Dr. Damolina to talk about surgery. Thank you.